Welcome to the podcast. Slightly different intro music this time. That's because my guest is Jan Ratzep, owner of the Black Metal Brewery. Jan's from Russia originally, but found himself here at the Edinburgh Uni doing a science PhD. He stayed on, and for the past few years, he's been brewing beautiful, strong beers, much to the delight of black metal fans everywhere and, of course, other beer lovers. My interview with Jan was more of a loose conversation over a couple of drinks than a formal interview. Well, Jan's not a formal kind of guy, as you'll probably hear. And we chatted about the recent Camera Beer Festival where I bumped into him, black metal, of course, his beers, his journey as a brewer, and, yeah, lots more in between. He's a really interesting guy. So pour yourself a drink and put on some black metal. Here's Jan. How did you enjoy the Camera Festival? Well... I didn't enjoy quite this year did one good thing. And uh, that was they took some casks as sale or return. Okay. And, and the thing is that the sale return basically if you tap they pay. If if not then not and they return the cask. But my two beers well uh, it was Will Wisp and it was the Gates of Valhalla mm-hmm. ran out on Friday afternoon as, as last year. A Friday afternoon? Yeah, so like the 7.30 uh, and then yeah. they Amazing. had all the whole time. So, um, and then they tapped another one for Saturday. I don't know how much of that was done, but a lot of beers were sold out, sold out, sold out. That's why they decided not to open on Sunday like last year. They, they didn't, but people who came and said were quite disappointed. No beers, you know. So sometimes they're open on a Sunday as well? They, they used to be, but it looks like the festival has gained the force. Okay. So uh, as a result, uh, they decided to, to do something to correct the last year's thing. I think they said they are not allowed to increase the uh, number of beers by more than like 7% a year or something like that. Okay. So they tried to... regulations, whatever kind okay. of regulations. Yeah, yeah. So they decided basically to have, a, to have it this way this year, and I think it was a good thing. Well, a few good beers, I had a few, um, and yeah, generally it was not disappointing. I went for two days in a row because I was judging at the, uh, the Champion Beer of Scotland. Okay. And then they brought some free beers and stuff. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and like, um, after that, it was, I was thinking that I was supposed to give a presentation, but something didn't work out with the trade session, so next year they said, Okay, still what presentation to do? Like giving some samples to, they wanted to make a trade session with people who are involved. Okay. Uh, like they said that anybody who has a personal license or whatever certificate can come in for free and have free pints. It's because they are trying to bring people, producers and well, not only consumers but also distributors and mm-hmm. retailers with each other. So. Do you find uh, some snobbery towards the image of your beer? Oh yes. Yeah. Plenty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't care. I'm sure you don't. Why should I? Yeah. Uh, good people still drink the beer and enjoy it. So the ones who don't want it are free not to. There are of course some people who are trying to contribute to my reputation. <laughs> Somehow. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I know that too. Yeah. Also, they give a fucking wolf themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. You're just sensing yourself. <laughs> That's very cute. <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you, I come from a kind of a punk rock background. Okay, That's good. Um, drinking and punk rock are kind of like that, you know. I see a similarity to the black metal oh. scene because. I think both scenes let you be yourself. Since they, they let you, 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 you basically let yourself, the, the, the scenes, it's not something that lets you, it's like being passive in, in certain ways. If you say that some, well, probably it's, it's just a linguistic. Mm-hmm. I know what you mean, yeah. Game. It's easier, shall we say, uh, to just, you know, to be in a context. But Black Matter, if you think has been Definitely, punk has contributed quite a bit to black metal because it was no black metal. In a way, there's always been black metal if you listen to some classical music. In a way, there's always been punk, and not as a music style, but as, as an attitude towards the world and perception as well. Yeah. As a, uh, as a fact, throughout the history, people have not changed in last least known 6,000 years of known history. Not just 
They have red groups, you know, new shapes and so on. And the, if you look at punk nowadays, it's something that's just fashion. And punk was against fucking fashion. That's, uh, so, and uh, the same when, when people are trying to copy the, you know, the, the black metal has revolutionized a lot. And, and drudged out, producing many subspecies and so on, this moral mood, and, rather than, oh, I'll play with Satan and uh, uh, kill a version, uh, uh, fuck you. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Of course. So, um, it's mood, it's vision, it's perception. It's uh, as well as, as punk, who says so it has quite a bit of overlap. I think there's a lot of overlap, and where I see the connection with the beer and punk anyway, or any kind of booze for that matter, mm-hmm. is more a connection with the subconscious, or with the inner child, or with lack of inhibitions. These two things go hand in hand. So, I don't know, do you think there's a similar situation in black metal and alcohol? Yeah, a similar relationship? The thing is that, yeah, of course, I, mean, they, they, I would say if people go to extreme, and very often people who are in the scene, as well as people who drive the scene somehow being producers or, or supporters, which both matters a lot. So I don't know, I'm pretty sure many of people who well, look at Dark Throne, but I don't know if they were drinking brake fluid or, or something like that, or antifreeze. Who? Dark Throne, for oh, example. Right. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> the, on the, the, of course, the, the punks in the Arctic, right, uh, yeah. at the same time, they contributed a lot to, to, to black metal, they want to say more. Mm-hmm. So there's massive overlap in yeah. um, many things. I mean, or take Gigi Allen uh, and, you know, uh, kind of fun, but I mean, there's so, so many black metal bands made covers of him, and uh, there's a total overlap. Is, uh, probably the difference is in attitude, but it's, what was Motorhead saying? It's all rock and roll in a way, you know, mm-hmm. so yeah. it's, 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 there is quite a bit of aesthetical perception in this. So, uh, I don't know, the black metal brewery comes from me and Pano completely. Hamlet, he was playing in the Monolith as a drummer. And, I was doing some stuff with him and then Moonrape with, uh, with Dave from Glasgow and Nachten. And then, so we were all kind of involved and always going to the gigs and so on. Uh-huh. And, but not as I said, the mood. So, and I was like, why not fucking Black Metal Brewery? That's, that's something that we would like the most the beer and the. Uh, the beer and the and, and black metal that, that, that really is, is satisfying and fulfilling and then nice get drunk we'll burn something <laughs> <laughs> makes perfect sense absolutely <laughs> and do you find people gravitate towards your beer because of the black metal label do you think that fans so s- who might not the labels kind of might be partial gateway mm-hmm. and that's thanks to Sean Parry it's, uh, a good friend and who's been doing the artworks and sometimes it came to his head sometimes he just sent me uh, a few things what do you think feels best for it and uh, and on the, actually just seen him first time in three and a half years so he made a, an addition oh, uh, uh-huh. in Barcelona he was a, a mid shop uh, to, to okay. move moved from Copenhagen to uh, to Barcelona I live in the middle of nowhere alright uh, my age travels all over the world America Scandinavia they were just he's in Iceland now and I'm waiting for him for, uh, for <laughs> to send uh, kind of the, his vision of the new beer as we made uh, but yeah um, this guy is, uh, is, uh, is absolutely great he's, he's created quite a bit of things and his vision is quite a bit overlapping with mine for, okay. for visual representation uh-huh. so obviously the labels somehow and yeah there's been a few people helping with the labels as well uh, mm-hmm. so uh, uh, so it's kind of collaborative things mm-hmm. people contribute quite a bit and without a lot of uh, help and support obviously that really wouldn't be possible just standing on the shoulders of giants and great people and loyal people as well mm-hmm. um, and yeah so the labels attracting attention, but the thing is that, uh, I said, the, the thing that gravitates, well, yeah, I think there's also gravity mm-hmm. that <laughs> gravitates people to, towards the beer and the, <laughs> and the overall taste. Yeah. Uh, so as I always said, the consumer votes with a pint, yeah. and that's as close to the actual, what people call democracy can be, I think. It's one pint, one vote. Yes. So you're actually elected. <laughs> that's it. And, and your, beer, your, your beer is elected. <laughs> Some people ask me, do you brew beer for uh, 
uh, like for higher alcohol content and blah blah blah. I said, well, we said no because it's not, it's not true. I've always been beer that I was bringing at home and probably at the farm when I was uh, made the uh, first pilot system at the farm about well, three years ago. Uh, but uh, before that, I was bringing at home, and my prototypes most of them were over eight, nine percent, okay. and and so on. So. Because I always like the beer to be tasty, mm -hmm. and of course you can do session ales, which are three point something percent. And I'm not against, uh, and so on. It's just probably I have not found uh, the recipe that or the, the, the approach and the taste that I would really like with that. Maybe because I have not tried hard enough. But generally, I'm. <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> I, 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 I'm tending to make the beers. The ones that I do like, I will follow at least uh, the, the prototype as, 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 and matching it uh, in, in the recipe uh, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, not to go completely ballistic, but still, it happens so that all my beers are above six percent, and that is a side effect of of my <laughs> uh, of, of 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 me not being or being basically genuine with most. Okay. Uh, I think the the mouths uh, being generous with mouths is, is, is not a bad thing. No. Uh, the thing you get much higher um, alcohol, the beer mm -hmm. to uh, to pay. Of course. Uh, as a result, um, yeah, the prices will be slightly higher, and many pubs, as I see, do not want it in, even though the public would love to. So a lot of it goes at the festivals. But the festivals are generally during the summer. Okay. So I think I'm going to change the mode a little bit and produce more casks for the warmer times of the year. Mm -hmm. um, some pubs do, do do take things that, for example, the um, the potting shed just next door. Mm -hmm. uh, they, um, they have a permanent light for me there. Um, so far, public has been always happy with it. Um, and I've seen people drinking my beer by pints and behaving okay. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> I think it's public, especially in Glasgow, where people are still behaving okay from my point of view. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, the pubs in Glasgow, uh, for example, as I understand, many of them do not want to have a cask on. I don't make, I don't do pins. Maybe I should, but it's, uh, you know, half a cask yeah. of uh, uh, so 41 liters, basically 20 liters. Uh, but they, they, they do not want to take it. It's not that overly expensive compared to some beers. Uh, keeping in mind the the ABV, mm -hmm. but at the same time uh, they do not want the they want the public to stay behind the bar for as long as possible and being active, <laughs> um, not under the table. Yeah. So uh, even though people generally are absolutely fine, okay, they get more drunk, but the uh, the Ivory Blacks in Glasgow, for example, the the uh, are having. Uh, the beer in, uh, on, all the time, so I'm supplying quite a bit. But Kevin, who is running it, is a metalhead, and he is dedicated. So he is. I mean, I've seen him washing the stage of the gates from pig's blood and stuff. You know, so he doesn't mind, yeah. and he really likes to, you know, for his place to hold the real metal gigs. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, he likes the real stuff too. So in many, in other places. I uh, would name them probably, probably not the best, but uh, any, anyway, the, I think they dropped the back metal brews even they were quite popular because of the profit margin. If you, like in the past, if you would sell red stripe, which you would buy for, I don't know how many dozen pennies, like 50, 60, 70 pounds probably you can, mm -hmm. and then you sell for nearly four quid in the, in the club. Yeah. The profit margin is immense. Yeah. Because they know people are going to come, they're going to want to drink, most of them are not going to smuggle anything in, so they're going to buy from behind the bar and going to buy whatever is available. Because at some point people just want to drink. Yeah. <laughs> so, here's the question. Yeah. Um, what I did like about Aero Blacks is that the guy is really supportive and he supports metal and he's a metal head mm -hmm. and he wants to be there. So he knows people are going to come. And they're going to come to the club to see a metal performance and metal gig and, and also get metal beer, which is not just a brand like the many out there now. Mm -hmm. So 
That's a genuine metal yes. crafty. Yeah, buy metal hats for metal hats, for fuck's sake. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this, that's the whole idea, and as I said before, if I wanted to just to get cash in, I would be selling Coca-Cola or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's no fucking point. <laughs> that's <laughs> The new beer is still called Lohi, some Finnish mythology that the wheat beer is going to be. I don't know. We'll see what she thinks about it. Mm. Uh, she's contribu- she has contributed to creation of beer itself, and it's in Kalevala, which is the Finnish uh, epic well, poetry. It's a basic collection of songs. But in other cases, I wouldn't use the, I wouldn't use the personal name of things, somehow historically related or second names or something but okay uh, interesting yeah or it's like some people use the lemmy's name what the fuck it's like and then they make like four percent some kind of thing that i what the fuck okay, like yeah. seriously they should be bitten to a pulp cheers that's awesome <laughs> has someone tried that that would be shocking hmm seen a couple of times in the net already mm-hmm. Also, like using the image of the dead guy, like mm-hmm. just dead and being a fucking legend, and uh, it's like, um, that's at least not respectful. No, that's at all. Yeah. It's true. That's pretty cool. But tell, tell me some more about your beers. So, which ones have you got at the moment? Which ones sell? I know that you're having, you know, strong beers, limits, your mm. market, your, your permanent, like, cask market. But what, what, do you, what do you sell most of and what do you have? I would say Yggdrasil sells the most. And I think that's because in people's perception it is a pale ale, so they drink much more of it. What's Icarus? Icarus is a, well, it's a world tree in German Scandinavian mythology, which holds nine worlds, including ours, which is Midgard. And uh, basically, well, I named uh, the pale ale after it, and it's six point six percent dry popped with the Marilla. Um, it's reasonably Strong, but at the same time not as strong. Most of the beers drink below the, uh, the the alcohol content that is declared in, uh, on them, even though they, they they have that content sometimes a little bit shoot shoot over. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, that's probably too on the record. Right. But anyway, okay, the, I'll edit that. Bit. I'll edit. Certainly. Edit that. <laughs> so um, uh, with the Brazil, people see that as pale and, and the gender drink more than, for example, the blood revenge, which is also 6.6. Blood revenge? Uh, it is the rice salt. Rice salt. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, for example, I, I don't know, that was the first night that I sold, well, not just sold it, uh, people drank a lot. Of, and not at all the drinks, something like 32, I think, uh, cases of ages of 33, and only under four of blood revenge. So okay. people's perception is uh, just pale ale the stuff. They have the same ABVs. Okay, one is more has more body and more dense and is dark as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's people's perception. I think that could drive a lot of things. Uh, well, not just I think, but through this. So. Mm-hmm. Well, the same as some stupid uh, comments like, oh, you let me brew, you should be making dark beers. Fuck. <laughs> Where did you come from? Yeah. <laughs> It's all black. It's got yeah. black written on it. Should be black. Yeah. So uh, then the world of whiskey is, uh, well, it used to be 6% also. I mean, two of the beers at 6.6 uh, came by accident pretty much to that to that level. Okay. Somehow dictated by a quantity of malts, I think I can fit in, uh, in the master. Okay. And, uh, and so, so uh, will the whiskey was 6%, so I declared more like 6.6 as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, not because it's my marketing strategy. <laughs> Because some people are like, yeah, yeah, it's the same, it's 6.6 to 6. I'm like, no, that would be a lie, because in, even in the lab, I would be enough to have such a precision. Yeah. Generally, it's, it's, not, it's not possible normally. So, uh, yeah, we'll always put juniper smoked uh, So I add juniper and then with the boil, and I use beach smoked malts so as opposed to, for example, oak smoked or peat smoked. It's not as smoky and it's more mild in flavor, so it's not a little bit not off-putting. Uh, in a way, even though it, it's mild compared to some Norwegian beers that uh, I tried, that, that they use juniper twigs uh, to 
put the run off through the, or the work through and uh, uh, they use the ultimate smooth mouse to basically get hit in the face okay. on the side of the of the smoke, ultimate smoke mouth and then hit in the face from the overall like total juniperness. So um, as for that, even, even though that, that probably is a dividing beer uh, for people, as some people and that, whatever the, the rating thing that like I don't like the smoke beers and then put the low ratings like why the fuck did you buy it? <laughs> It says clearly, you're yes. smoked and you don't like smoke beers. You don't need to try. So, but I can't believe people do that. That's so true. Yeah, well, people do a lot of things. Um, so, uh, and, <laughs> and that brings your overall rating down. So. Mm. The thing is, as, as I don't remember if I mentioned it, um, I have an overlap of two things, of two worlds, if you wish. Mm-hmm. The metal world. And I would say we could do like uh, the beers that they make, that the brewery produces. Uh, they are one of the most loyal customers and they do support a lot. And that's the thing about the, the metal folk. Mm-hmm. And from the other side, it's people who are into real ale and uh, people that really like the, the good beer and not necessarily into metal. And there's been a lot of support from their side too, which I truly appreciate. Um, so I think in this in, in this sense it's, it's also you get the confirmation by by both sides, not just uh, and as I would not go for trends, which I really don't like and what people expect and so on. So if you, you get solid base of fans formed, which I think is the right thing to do. So uh, slowly, step by step, it's been over two years and we're at the premises of Top Out. So yeah, then the, the other two beers that I recently produced was um, uh, Blood, which is uh, oatmeal rice stout, 8.1%, and gets about half oatmeal pale ale, 7.9, so both around 8, pretty much, and uh, put two casks in Kilderkin on 20th, on 20th of February, and launched with the most pretty successful, I would think, down, people downed completely the Gates of Aral, a cask, one night and nearly down the uh, blood, which I did the day after, not the next day, because it was Sunday, the day after. It was quite good, so black metal blasting uh, throughout the night in the farm. Like 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 <laughs> total takeover, yeah. We <laughs> had these black things that looked like graves, and so oh, yeah, this thing will get. So we just put runes and uh, well, we made a satanic altar with candles, and it was, it was good. That's well, amazing. I, I, it all went really, really, really well. Uh-huh. So, uh, as even in the last pints of you, they, since February, I don't know how often they, they publish it. There is a photo from, from there. That's uh, when I read about that. That's right, I was uh, looking at the pints of you, and there's a kill yeah, that can yeah, take over. Uh, you used uh, the pop-up brewery. I didn't use them. I, uh, Kind of, I was cooking brewing in there, renting premises from there. I have a uh, fermenter now, and let's see what happens. Uh, but yeah, the guys have been really supportive for the last uh, two years, over two years. And with Michael met by absolute accident, because I was uh, going to support every day, every evening on the way from university. I was working at uh, home, I was passing Martin Road, and the cork and cask mm-hmm. shop was just open. And that uh, was run by Chris. Chris Mitchell, who actually gave me quite a bit of valuable uh, advice mm-hmm. uh, in the course of like, over a year uh, until I stopped passing there because they just uh, stopped the university uh, with the PhD and started brewing uh, full on. So, uh, and Michael was giving the first presentation of his beers there, so I came in and blah blah blah, and I see the person and I like, look, kind of building this, built this with a farm as well, and that's yes, black metal brewery. I had no idea that he was a metalhead as well. Oh, is he? He already had short hair and uh, <laughs> so on, but then it some, somehow was invited uh, later on to brew the premises. And then I found out that Michael had been into black metal for ages and, and long before I knew the things. Uh, uh, like he's been to Dynamos and to all the types of uh, European festivals. And uh, I don't know. so in Seoul, he still is. I, I've noticed that there are so many people who are into metal, uh, uh, who are in the beer, producing the beer, 
or uh, distributing the beer or, or, or working the beer in any other ways, not even saying about mentioning the uh, consuming it. <laughs> <laughs> vast quantities. Vast quantities of good market, but you're saying there's a lot of people involved in them as well. Yes, of course, and that's, and that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. In what I've noticed in small scale brewing is a lot of people uh, are, especially the brewers, tend to be much more chilled out people. You have quite a bit of responsibilities and things to look after, but in general, there's something that makes people more chilled in their head or something, or, or maybe just gathers certain people and I mean, in brewing community, if you're really a, a shit person, that sometimes there's going to be known uh, because people talk to each other. I don't mean to gossip because I know some people that are spreading absolute shit about me, um, but that happens everywhere and anywhere. So, uh, but generally, it's a lot of a lot of uh, collaboration rather than competition, for example. That's good. So, uh, and yeah, help you. In, Quite often, when you didn't really truly ask for that, kind of, you know, what some obviously facilitated, facilitated, and uh, um, yeah, and the same from from my side, whatever uh, advice I can I can provide or you know help somehow. You're happy to share. Of course, mm-hmm. that's as I said, it's more collaboration than in competition. There's it's the big boys out there who are real competitors. That's true. That's very true. Or damping the prices, you know, and, and so on, and taking uh, over the market. And day before yesterday, you were like us, and now yeah, you're trying to you're up your arse. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you say you've got your own fermenter. Is that in, mm. on those for now? I, it is. Uh, yeah, it is uh, the top of the because the world well, is also uh, got their own uh, the third fermenter in as well. So. I hope to be able to somehow expand. Um, we'll see. Fingers crossed. Okay. I don't want to talk about it before the actual things happen. So, uh, but a lot of things on the on the table, and uh, I don't want obviously to grow too too fast as well. And I do not like the whole idea of growing too big either. I don't know where I would cap my production. To go step by step, and some some offers I couldn't take because uh, I wouldn't be able to satisfy the demand. Okay. Um, and then we'll see, because it's all, it's all up to be seen. It's, <laughs> how, how can it, see, how well, just can see it how it develops, you haven't got a massive plan where I'm going to eat no, every the, Aldi in the country. No, <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. The Aldi, I think, did a really good thing by, for, by providing small brewers. Um, with the opportunity to put the beers out there, For sure. and also getting an order from like smaller, even smaller production scale breweries, which will, for them it's kind of a present that helps them to get more known and also push quite a bit of beer at once, which helps uh, the cash flow as well. Because mm-hmm. many cases, I mean, there has been many cases when it was uh, you would struggle quite a bit. And, I don't really care if so I pay for the flat, the bills, and I don't mind what I eat. <laughs> and I already have the carbohydrates. All right. That's true, that's true. That's your plan, isn't it? A Make plan, sure you've the got plan. enough to eat. <laughs> yeah, well, the, 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 the vision is anyway, you can foresee maybe two, three months the things that are changing before, before things get more stable. Things are constantly changing, even as I heard from. Some brewers who've been there for way longer. Uh, it's like the guy from Man came and told me, like, yeah, it's always going to be breaking even. So you always have to fix something, you always have to replace something, you always have to upgrade, you always have to expand, you always have unforeseen circumstances. Kind of. So basically, and uh, for which I said I'm uh, happy to serve the honest. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that fulfills the, the existence to a great extent. Uh-huh. And, and of course, making thousands of people alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> or helping them on their way at least, yeah. Well, not to become shit ones, but yeah. quality ones. Quality, quality alcoholics, no, I like it. A, a, that's a joke, of course. Half joke. <laughs> <laughs> loyal customers, let's just call them loyal customers. No, of course, no. no loyal customers, uh, really loyal customers know what to fucking drink. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing. First, there's a lot of... Uh, 
as the initial uprise, I like to people constantly looking for something novel. And that's the thing that a lot of people who brew try to achieve. They always try to follow a certain trend, which happens who started. But since these people are drinking this now, so we're going to start doing this, we're going to start making this, we're going to start decorating our place in a certain way, which is trendy now, blah, blah, blah. Then yeah. the decoration. And I don't know what they're trying to, to catch. Well, a bit of, well, they're feeling on the, you know, the, the top of the way where, where the, you, you get the cash flow, you know, like, you know. But I don't, I don't see that as something that I would be really interested in, because it's pointless. To follow the people's trends, people change with the, the mind, with the wind, you know, and what, whatever the wind blows. I'm, I'm fairly confident that black metal will never be on trend. It shouldn't be, otherwise it's not black metal. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> black consumerism. <laughs> yeah, wish. Have another sip of this. Yeah, uh, let's have another sip. Nice one. You can tell me where, where people can buy your black uh, beers. And well, um, things that I do publish on the, the things on the website. Mm -hmm. I don't always do it extremely up to date because people in the age thing and stuff. It's, just, uh, <laughs> it's, it's too lazy to update or like yeah, fair enough, fair enough, can't log in or, or, or something. But um, yeah. for, for the rest, there's a lot of locations the part of the website which is named locations. So you just go online and find out so I, whatever I, you've got. Yeah, I use I use some social media like you know, Facebook, book and Twitter. <laughs> uh, once in a while, I've not been approaching any big distributors. So Ailsa is doing distribution in the West Coast, for example. They got the cask covered in a couple of times as well, to six degrees north. Um, and then sometimes when you know I can send views on occasion. Um, Somebody's going down south, whatever, I should probably do it more with bands. Uh, well, a friend was, was moving to Brighton? A friend was moving to Bristol. Bristol, okay. Yeah, not Brighton, Brighton, another, another mate thing. Uh, so I uh, was moving to nearby, near, a place nearby Bristol uh, for like half a year. I just met the person who was running a metal pub with Gryphon in, uh, at my launch in Kildurkin here. I was launching the gates of a house and uh, a Newton blood. He was like, yeah, right, man, like the beers and I hear a concept, so if I can get the beers down there. So when I could, I sent him a couple of casks, a few cases, all went. So it would be good. Once I can offer more, then yeah, I'll probably talk to a distribution company or something, or I don't know, again, it depends, because there are some people who are kind of fine with having a van and you know going for a journey and then make a journey yourself drop yeah. the casks off or, yeah. and then come back and then come back for more adventures and pick the casks the empties up from the only the only concern I haven't asked some bands to, to do that but the only concern is that the, the, the lads on the way will say like Fuck it, let's have a scarf. Drink it. Yes, that's the. You know, the never gonna be delivered. Like, sorry, yeah, no, couldn't control it or something like that. It's three pounds fifty. I can, I can, I can <laughs> foresee it like whole cast, like never delivered. But fuck it. No, we'll see. I think that's a valid concern. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's more than valid concern. I, I just fucking know. It's knowledge, yeah. <laughs> Practical. <laughs> Do you produce more bottles or casks? I mean, I could see it being easier to send casks around the place. No, more bottles. Yeah? It's easier to sell bottles for, for now. As I said, there's an issue with, uh, with pops taking the bill. Mm. I mean, again, I have not advertised myself that much because sometimes I run out of casks. And then, or I only have casks of uh, the, the recently it was uh, a few months ago now. Uh, I ran out of most of casks except for like Gates of Hell and a few casks. Well, several casks were already reserved, so I couldn't really offer okay. any more. Mm -hmm. than, so, so, so that's the thing. More storage space, more beer I can make, more beer I can mature. With more types of beer, I can continue uh, uh, finish writing a liquid album, at least the first one. That's uh, a person that I know said, she said that she compared it to liquid soundtracks some years ago. 
And I was like, well, that's, that's actually a real kind of definition of what I'm doing. So it's, it is music, but it's in liquid form. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like yeah, the first, the first three was an EP. So in Brazil, we'll with Gates of Valhalla. There's two more. And the sixth one is in Fermento, which is a wheat beer, which we're going to see what it turns like. So uh, first I I thought, that. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's uh, it's being bottled uh, the after tomorrow. I look forward to seeing the label for that as well. Probably oh, me too. Mm-hmm. Have you not seen it yet? No. Mm-hmm. Yes, I know. The label takes time to make as well. Mm-hmm. It's one person who is drawing his vision and then that goes into in the process of putting the things together and actually the label together and so on and so on and so on. And it all depends, it's not just one person so anyways, it's more complex than, than just sitting at home and printing it uh, just in one night. Yeah, so. I can imagine. Yeah. Have you considered making booze? Uh, well, the thing is that I've, uh, I've made mead before a few mm-hmm. times, but well, that requires a maturation of, uh, of around uh, a year at least. Mm-hmm. Well, for, for young mead, and probably less, but for the proper mead, I would say a year. Okay. With conditions in the bottle as well, and then just really good. <laughs> That's how I got into uh, brewing on a larger scale, or was it, um, was it a farm? Yeah, anyway, um, the person I was working with uh, was a beekeeper. Mm-hmm. He brought me some honey that he couldn't sell. Because I imagine that he was making mead and wanted to make more. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, well, the, give you a couple of buckets of honey, uh, which I can't sell because it's been overheated by accident. And so the taste is not right, but for your purpose is probably fine. So that's exactly what I did. I took the honey, turned it into meat, and then it's been mature for at least a year and for longer and uh, gave a couple of bottles back to the to the beekeeper and uh, he brought it to uh, to a place where he was starting to like he was playing his retirement. He wanted and he did start uh, the beekeeping place like a proper one making courses for educating people uh, making them beekeepers and so on and, and yeah so I was invited to start the farm and then I continued for nearly a year I built a own system 100 liter pilot system uh, using gas burners and well optimized it optimized the recipes for the uh, from homebrew scale to 100 liters and uh, and then at some point met Michael and, and so on, so it's uh, who invited me later on to brew at the uh, premises of Top Up Brewery and uh, to bring them. Basically, the idea is to brew on and. Keep on brewing and metal. Stay there. <laughs> Nobody stays there anymore. Like, uh, even if that. Uh, <laughs> uh, fuck that. I, I was stage diving with a broken jaw at Ashgold at oh, yeah. Marduk. It was three months from the tenement place in the door. And people now, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. They, they don't just not, not stage that. Maybe some had like, but like the band is finishing the set. And it's like, it's not like, it's like people clapping their fucking hands. And I couldn't believe it. Like, what the fuck is this? I, I, I see it already not once. And it's, it's, it's a horrible tendency. Like, I think, I think it's really, really. It's, well, what do you think is going on? Different people getting into metal, or the metalheads becoming too polite. I think probably both. I just I see the de- degeneration completely. Like, yeah. Uh, oh no. But <laughs> drink and puke and fight and I don't know. Just you know, be real. Yeah. <laughs> Is that your message to the world? Drink, no, that's, that's... puke, fight, be real. <laughs> well, I mean, it's one of the many. One of many. Uh, I... <laughs> Anything else to add? Uh, I would add some to this glass. If there is anything. Uh, no, no, I've drank it all. Okay, let's go to Ashes. Let's go to Ashes. Thanks for coming. Well, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure. <That's> amazing. <laughs>